quite a huge amount of people. I hope you're right. There's no free beer around here. Yeah, so it's just a talk. And uh, be warned, this definitely is a purely technical talk. So there will be no fancy 3D animations uh, flowing around the room and stuff like that. It, you will see Puppet code, for examples. You will see code that is not working. You will see how to adopt your code to make it working again when using Puppet 4. So my name is Martin. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Example 42. Maybe some of you know Example 42, uh, well known for offering Puppet modules. Um, and I'm very happy to have one announcement, uh, because yesterday I received a notification that we in Germany have received the official legal registration letter for our company, which definitely makes us the youngest company here at PuppetConf, because we are one day old by now. So. <laughs> And I appreciate that we can celebrate our birth within this f almost, almost, with all you as an auditorium, and uh, that Puppet Labs even is doing the birthday party for us. So it's not the only birthday party we have this year. There's also another one. Puppet Labs turned 10. It was uh, March or April, depending on which source you refer to on Google. There's uh, the picture. It refers to a source from Luke, so I hope he's right with uh, someone April 30, I suppose it is. So Puppet Labs went 10 years old. So all the stuff we are doing by now, its core, has been done 10 years ago. We're doing the stuff since 10 years by now. So we started with an early version. The first version I found evidence uh, on, on Google was 0.22 back in 2007. Uh, who, who started using 20, 0.22 in 2007? Oh, yeah, two people, of course. Yeah, the, the same. They, they used all the versions of Puppet Labs, of course. Uh, so since uh, this year, uh, it was uh, April 15th. We now have Puppet 4 in place. So it's already six months old. Um, and I'm eager to learn who's already using Puppet 4. It's a few people only. OK. So I hope the rest of us is all already with Puppet 3 and no longer with Puppet 2. Uh, either way, if you do Puppet 2 or Puppet 3 and you want to migrate, don't do the intermediate Puppet 2 to Puppet 3 migration. First, just migrate to Puppet 4 directly. So this talk will cover things that I believe are very essential and very positive for Puppet in different, in different terms. The first thing is performance and metrics. This is not something really new. It was announced last year at PuppetConf, and the Puppet server itself was already available when PuppetConf started. The new Puppet server, uh, so old, elder people might know, yes, there has been this Ruby on Rails application, and you had to configure Nginx or Apache and Mass Passenger to put some performance out of it. Now we have the JVM-based Puppet server system with Trapper Keeper included, which allows us to easily just add more compiled to servers. So we have the performance, and we have yeah, performance increasement easily covered with the Puppet server. The next thing which was announced on last year's PuppetConf was having metrics. So everybody is doing monitoring, so in case that something is not working. But what people also like to see is what is not working as expected inside of my Puppet server. Why does my catalog compilation does take this long? What is it? And then you can easily find out, oh, I have a function that takes a huge amount of time to return data. So you know where to dig into it. So it was also a very positive way for Puppet itself to analyze the behavior of your Puppet master. The next thing is more something like in general. I first thought doing something about orchestration, but I let that to Puppet Labs. They can explain that far more better than I do. So I instead said, said instead, let's do something like ongoing improvements. This is something I really like within this company, that they always do stuff. They listen to the community. They listen to the people who make use of their software, and they adopt. They adopt in terms like, let's, let's do something easier for installing Puppet Agent. So they did the all-in-one AIO agent packages. So everything is bundled in one place. Everything is put into one place. I know people complaining about, uh, yeah, then, but then Puppet Labs needs to update the SSL, which is bundled inside their application. Yes, they have to. They have to, of course. There's factor, factor updates that came lately. Uh, maybe you have heard of C factor for quite some time. It was a re-implementation of factor, but not, no longer written in Ruby, but they started using C++ code. Why? It's faster. It's really heavily faster. 
And with the new version of factor, you not just only get key equals value elements back from factor, you also get structured facts, mostly as a hash. You have the PuppetDB, which has major improvements in terms of speed, performance, availability. And of course, now they added this orchestration tool. So they, this is something I really like, that they do most of their stuff and talk about that and listen to the people that make use of their software. Another thing already quite common, workflows. So I'm working on my laptop. I'm working with a Git repository. I'm checking in some code into a Git repository. Yeah, but will that somehow magically flow over to my Puppet Master and appear there so I can make use of it? Somehow, yes. The first thing, you have to have environments. And within the beginning of Puppet, they said, yes, environments is something you have to configure in the Puppet conf file. So your pure Puppet Master who sat there and said, I'm managing the Puppet Master, some developer showed up telling him, I need a new environment on the Puppet Master. He had to configure the file, hopefully automatic or manually, and restart the Puppet server so that the new environment appears. We had some intermediate with dynamic-based environments. Now we have directory-based environments. The directory-based environments means we have everything in one place, and we can configure per environment settings, something like config version, or activating the new parser on a very specific environment. Uh, don't make me fit on the number version 3.6 for Puppet or higher. Uh, I always forgot the version when they added the future parser. Um, but at least it's available in the later three serious versions of Puppet. So you can test the code. Is it working with Puppet or with Puppet 4? Or will it break somehow? And then you have the R10K toolchain to manage the rollout of your Git branch-based repositories into your certain environments on the Puppet server. So this is all now handy and in place. And then we're coming to Puppet 4. And I preferred, I decided to use enhanced encoding as the title of this section of the talk. And this is something where you can split up into three different areas. The very first one is new language features, stuff that has been not there in Puppet 3, which is not compatible to Puppet 3, which will not work on Puppet 3. It will work on Puppet 4 only. The first thing is we have lambdas. So lambdas are now offer us a possibility of in-code handling with data and data types. It allows us, for, easy, for example, iterating over an array, which was not possible in Puppet 3. We had to find other ways on how can we iterate over an array in Puppet 3. Within these lambdas, we have the possibility of getting functions. And we have several functions already built in. Each function iterating over an array, we can map arrays or hashes, we can filter, we can reduce, we can slice. We have several functions built in. This is not the complete list, this is far more longer, but I was limited in the space on uh, horizontal vertical, vertical direction, so I couldn't add all of them. So how, what is the benefit now of having these lambdas and the functions inside of Puppet 4? Well, in the old time, you said, okay, I want to create a few symlinks. From one directory, I have some files, I want to symlink them to another directory and be available there. So what is it that you did? Okay, I have a variable, I'm putting an array inside. Uh, what was it when I put an array into a title, Puppet itself will split it up into multiple resource types or even, in this case, a defined resource type. Then you hopefully have followed the standard for Puppet by putting each class and each define into a single file. So your next file kept your defined resource type, saying you, okay, now I'm making use of the title, and now I'm creating the symlinks. So you want to analyze this stuff, you need to have two files open. The one that declares your def de defined resource type, and the one that defines your re defined resource type. With Puppet 4, you can now put everything into one place. It's one file only you have to open, and you can easily identify what, why is, what is happening around here. You don't have to open a second file. You can make use of the variable, iterate over the variable, put this thing into a, some kind of new variable, and then make use of this new variable, and you have all of your links ready and in place. What I've shown you without getting in detail 
With Puppet 4, you have two different ways of using functions. The first one is the standard way. Using the function, opening a bracket, putting in some thing, data, strings, variables, closing the bracket. This is the standard type where you have, which you have used in Puppet 2, Puppet 3, and this, of course, working in Puppet 4. Puppet 4 itself now brings some kind of new style. The Ruby way, uh, suppose the proper term is something like postfix notation. So you have the variable, it's a certain data type, and then you can add a dot, and regarding to the data type, you have several different functions available afterwards. In this case, I can iterate over a variable with the name, silly name, dollar variable. So the both ways are available. Personally, I prefer the second one. The next thing we have in Puppet is the template, the template engine. Everybody knows the ERB template engine. And I know especially people who are completely fresh to Puppet, who have never done some coding, they are completely afraid of it because they say, what is it, embedded Ruby? I, I have to code Ruby now. Oh, I don't know Ruby at all. Uh, how should I create a template without knowing Ruby? Uh, it's a simple thing. It's, it's embedded Ruby. It's only a small subset of Ruby. You don't have to code Ruby. Yeah, but I'm still very afraid of doing that. So Puppet Labs offered now the possibility of building templates with Puppet syntax inside. Um, there are two functions, like the normal template function. We have now have the EPP function. Instead of the inline template function, we now have the inline EPP function. So how, how does it look like a template that is based on Puppet DSL code? Well, most of the stuff is similar to a normal template. So we have the opening tag, we have the closing tag, absolutely identical. With one side, we don't use the add variable name syntax anymore. So which was like referring to add, use this variable from the local scope where the template is used in. We can now reference variables by giving their puppet namespace scope to it. So the FQDN is absolutely clear. This is the factor variable FQDN. And iterating over arrays is the same syntax as inside Puppet DSL by now. You don't have to learn something new. You can just reuse what you do in the, with the Puppet code and reuse it in a template. And by the way, Puppet offers also some nice ways. You know how to evaluate an ERB template? It was this ERB command with minus T minus R piping that into Ruby minus C. Uh, it was a really weird thing to test templates for proper syntax. Since this is now Puppet code, it's Puppet itself that can check for proper code. And you have a new command available. It's Puppet EPP. And you're done. You just provide the name. Hey, dear Puppet, use the EPP parser and please parse this template and check it for errors. So no need for doing some weird ERB Ruby pipe Ruby code for testing your templates. And the real nice thing is you can use of these templates in combination with HereDoc. Who had tried to put large file content into a manifest? So at least I tried it. But it's really looking ugly. Because with, with line breaks somewhere in the code, uh, you had all these nice um, um, tabs to, to, to make your code view readable. Then you had these somehow uh, longer string sections with new lines, and it was falling down to the first line, and it was really looking ugly. And Puppet now offered the possibility to do it shell-like here doc command. So you're referring to a marker, and somewhere within your code you have the marker. And to prevent this, all this indention to do, you can just put a pipe sign and say this is where the indention should take place. So, and it's similar to ERB, the minus prevents a new line, the pipe sets the indention. You can even use variable substitution right inside this here doc by just putting the marker in double quotes. Then it's a sign for Puppet, okay, use the one that is in here. And in case that there is a variable, please do variable substitution. In case that you use shell escape sequences, you can give a, a marker an additional option on please also evaluate the following escape sequences. How does this look like? So we want to set a variable and we have a multi-line thing to add yeah, just set the marker. Don't forget the end of the marker, of course. And then just add the code you need. 
And afterwards, you can just use the inline EPP function, which will properly parse the template you've put inside the multi-line multi -line, multi -line based variable. What I'm not showing here uh, is the data in templates. You can have data in templates, and they can, data can have of certain types. You can check for certain types. This is especially then useful when you say this template is not only used by that specific module. It's a more generic template that can be used by several modules. And by using the EPP function, you can provide a hash map with parameters that will be inserted into the template. How often did I have used the type word by now? I don't know. Three times, four times, two times, three, three, three times, I, put, I assume. So it seems to be something very important to Puppet when talking about types. So what types is it that we have available? Yeah, we have lots of types. We have strings, we have array, we have hashes. Uh, oh, there's bool. Yeah, OK. Uh, what about integer? What about float? Ah, we don't need them. Uh, why do you not need them? Ah, we put everything in a string. Puppet will interpolate by himself. Oh, we're making assumptions that Puppet will deal with our code in the proper way. Mm, that's not really nice. So the thing is, why do we want types? Why do we need types? We want to be, when using Puppet, you always want to be explicit. You never, you as the one doing the code, you would never like to guess what is happening because it means you enforce Puppet for you guessing what might be wrong. You always want to be explicit and absolutely sure what is happening in your Puppet code. And a nice quote from James Fryman, it was more related to chat ops, uh, but I really like the quote, is protect yourself from yourself. You now write Puppet code, and it's working flawlessly, and 12 months later, someone is showing up and saying, yeah, we need an improvement on the code. Uh, we need to put some data inside. And when you're precisely defi defined what is it that this module should do, then you know precisely on how to adopt now without thinking, what is it that I did 12 months ago? Oh, my God. OK. I can use the Git history. Yes, of course. Yeah. Luckily, there's Git. Someone changed things? Ah, Git blame. I really like it. So why do we need types? Um, so you're the Puppet rookies in your company. And you started implementing Puppet, and you wrote small modules, said, ah, we don't need that bloated SSH module around there. Uh, we can make use of a, of a sim real, very, very simple module. We have one identical setup to all of our servers. So it's in place, and it's working. And one day, your colleague shows up and asks you, this is already the second? No, it's the first. Ask you, hey, uh, I've heard you have an SSH configuration thingy you're doing around there, which will distribute it to an enormous amount of servers in an automatic pattern. He says, yes, yes, I'm enjoying my job. And he's telling you, yes, uh, oh, we, we would like to make use of it. But for any certain weird reason, we have to configure SSH client only, and we are not allowed to run the SSH server. Can you write code for us? So since you already have some experience with Puppet, you say, yes, it's no problem. I'll offer you a parameter. Just make use of that parameter. OK, OK. So um, you, do, you, do you believe you might have finished that by end of next month, maybe? And you say, ah. Wait five minutes. You've got it. So you could, what, what is it that I have to do? And you write it down. Do it like this way. OK, true or false, you mentioned. Yes, true or false. Exactly. True is the default. If you want to switch it off, just set false. So your colleague gets over to his another department saying, hey, they have really smart people around there. It's really awesome working with them because we had a problem and they fixed it for us. It's really cool. And they showed out how, now, how to make use of their module. And your colleague is adding now his own Puppet code to his module, making use of your module, and he's setting SSH to false. Yeah. So half an hour later, the same colleague appears, and he's not that kind anymore. He said, we have rolled this out to 1,500 servers, and we have this SSH daemon running, which should not be run because it's against compliance. And he told him, yes, but I told you, set it to false. I did so. And I can change it to whatever. True, false, foo, ba, it's always, it, that, is it just a parameter for fun? Is it really doing something? So now you're digging in the code and saying, you, you are digging into foreign code, checking and showing, you did it wrong there. No, I will not fix it. We have it rolled out 
fix it on your side. So, okay, you start, oh my God, okay, what is it that I need to do? With Puppet 3, okay, there's stdlib. You could make use somehow of a validate function. Um, yeah, and you test it, and even that is not working properly because it's the wrong way on how to set the data. Okay, next approach is uh, I enforce that his value should be, so this is still string, is it true or is it false when you just validate the stuff? Mm -hmm, I don't know, I want to be sure. So I'm setting something like a local variable and I'm dealing with the data they deliver and I just migrate these data into another data type. So I'm, I'm, I'm now, what is it to say best? I'm, I'm now taking other people's data and transforming them. I perform actions on them. I should deal with them, so read them, but I should never modify them. And this is what exactly what you're doing here. You're enforcing, if it's a string, make it the bool. So, okay, your colleague is happy. At last, he made it working. He made it working. It's end of the month, like I mentioned. Huh? So nothing with these three-hour agile CD stuff. Can forget about it. It's not working at all. So this is the reason why you definitely want types. You want types in Puppet 4, especially when it comes to more complex, more complex data types, a hash map. So how many arrows are inside this hash map? I can give you a hint. One hand. There's five arrows inside. Somewhere there's missing quotes around, uh, and a bool is put into a string. There's uh, an, an int. It should be a number, but it's now without quotes, and it says it's a leasing zero, and there's a home directory with a missing leading slash. So quite a lot of errors in such a short thing here. And you have immediately spotted it. I know it. Yes, definitely. So this is the reason why you want types and you need types. And with Puppet 4, you have a fully typed system now. So when you add a parameter, instead of doing a huge bunch of code with data validation afterwards, you just specify on the parameter, I expect this parameter of being of type integer. And it may have a value somewhere between 22 and 480. In this case, I just specify the parameter to be a bool value. If I would have set that in place in the first time when my colleague showed up on my desk telling him that I need the module but not managing the server side, and I would have done it this way, and he writes his code, he immediately gets an error on his note while the master compiles the catalog, telling him, hey, my dear, hey, my dear, you're doing something wrong. I expect that this should be a bool value and you provide a string. So it's no longer your fault, it's your colleague who has to fix his own code. It's not you doing something work around for other people not knowing how to deal with your code. So it's really nice having the type system inside Puppet. Also when it comes to more complex data. So I have a my users module that reads somehow from a hash, the hash we saw lately here. So I said this is a hash. And the keys are string. And within a string, so the next element, is a structure I have inside there. So I don't have, I, I tried it uh, with, with doing everything in one line, so also providing the information in the struct within the, the variable uh, at the, as a parameter. But this is not looking nice, and the return result, the error message that will appear is somehow confusing. Uh, Eric promised me that with the future, with the next Puppet version, they will also do proper messages when you do the type declaration directly on the parameter, even if it's a complex data type. So in this case, I said, okay, I, make, I just make it twice. I make it in my define, I do a data validation in my define, I do a data validation in my class, and I see there's an error, because this should not be a curly brace, it should be a round, a round brace. Otherwise, it's not working. So I check inside the data and see, okay, this should be of integer. This should follow a pattern. There should be a slash inside. Uh, okay, I'm not using Windows, so that is the reason why I'm happy with slash. Um, and the rest should be a Boolean value. And I get detailed information what is not working, what is of wrong data type. And this is done on the Puppet Master while he compiles the catalog. So the agent will never receive something in case that you provide wrong data. Nice. So what data types are available? This is also, again, only a very, very short subset. You have integer, you have float. You can, you can provide a minimum to a maximum value where you say this integer, otherwise you offer somehow the availability to, uh, you can, I need a listen port. We are not allowed to run SSH on port 22. 
So you offer a listen port and just provide it as a parameter, naming it's an integer. And the people start using an integer and saying the listen port should be 128456. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, what does it do? Will it recount from 65,553 or I don't know. So you can even specify, no, you're only allowed to provide data within a certain range. You can have patterns, you can have regular expressions, Boolean, arrays, structs. There's a huge list of types, types that are available. Next to the types, there's also something new in Puppet. That's not true. We have functions for quite a long time. Yes, this, the functions we know so far are the version 3 API functions. We now have a new API, for, a new way for providing functions. Functions that will do something that other functions never did before. They can evaluate data types. And they can be namespaced. What a mess. I have two different modules, and both developers decided to have a different function with a similar name. Which function is it that I will see on my agents? Alphabetically order? Time-based order? Mm, Directory-based order? I don't know. What a mess. I'd like to use that function, but I only receive the other function because it's a flat namespace in Puppet 3. So with Puppet 4, the first thing, you can make use of data types. Within a function, you just, just say puppet functions. It's no longer puppet parser functions. It's just puppet functions. You just say, I create a function, and I'm dispatching. And I'm dispatching, checking for the parameter that I provide should follow a certain pattern. So IP param or FQDN param. I have one function, a resolver function. And depending on the data that I provide to this function, it will either return the FQDN, the DNS entry for an IP address, or it will return the IP address for a given FQDN. So there's no error checking around here that DNS is available and delivers proper result. It's just an easy example. So this is the first thing, using the dispatch, and afterwards have several definitions, making use of the according dispatch. You have now separate data codes. So if you want to add a new parameter, you don't have to work on the big block in your function. You can say, I'm just dispatching. And afterwards, I'm writing a function, a specific def define for this specific dispatch. And the, name, and the namespace, it follows the pattern of manifest. Just add one more directory in the functions directory, and perfectly, you have your namespace. You're free to choose. As a module developer, I would suggest make use of your module name there, at least. Uh, so I have now a subdirectory utils, would mean my function, when I want to make use of my function, I have to call the function utils colon colon resolve. Another module may have the same name of the function, but it's, for example, Apache colon colon resolve. It's a complete different function that does complete different stuff, but they, are now, they can now coexist both on the agent side. And I make use of my function, saying, OK, I'm using one. First time, I'm using just a string, providing some domain name. And the secondary, I call it with uh, an IP address. And depending on the data I use inside the function as parameter, I'm getting different results, as expected. So lots of new stuff where we can deal with in Puppet 4. Awesome stuff. I really like the type system. It's really cool. It reduces my code by almost, at least in the, the parameterized class, by nearly 50 to 80 percent, because I'm getting rid of all this validate underscore is underscore functions. Uh, I don't have to check anymore. I just provide it when, de when declaring my parameters. I just put the type in front of it. Really cool stuff. Functions with namespaces. I don't no longer need to bury, ar bury around. Can I make use of a validate underscore string function a different way than stdlib? Ah, I'll give it a namespace, so it's a different function. Really cool. But what is it? With great power comes great responsibility. Puppet 4 also breaks, hardly, br real hard breaks, with many things that have been deprecated for quite some time. I'm very happy about that. Uh, on last year's Puppet Conf, I was talking to Henrik uh, regarding this, and I'm asking, oh, awesome, will you also deprecate the exec provider? Uh, no, he looked at me, said, are you completely nuts? No, we need it. We need, we need it even in our own modules. Uh, okay, 
couldn't we do something like an attribute that you add like when you want to remove a core pa package from, from Debian? Yes, comma, I know what I am doing, exclamation mark. Uh, but he was not really confined with this. So exec provider still exists. Yes, OK. Uh, exec resource type, I'm sorry. So the first thing, who's using inheritance in general? You, have to, you don't use inheritance, I know. So everybody, who's using inheritance? Who's using inheritance on node base? So nobody does some code like this, that you define a node that is non-existent? At least one hand, I see it, okay. Uh, so you, you, you have a node, you declare a node which is non-existent, it's not there. It's just some kind of a yeah, dummy node. I want, you want to make use of that node later on, on your real node declaration, and telling your real node, please inherit everything from that other node declaration over there. And this is no longer working in Puppet 4. It will break. It will hard break by telling you no inheritance on node level is no longer supported. That doesn't mean inheritance is gone completely. It's still inside, but it's no longer allowed inheriting nodes. Why is this? So this is the error message you receive. And I could not parse. Node inheritance is not supported. Please see the node inheritance deprecation website. At least he's so kind offering you a site which describes why is this broken and how do you have to fix it? So why is this broken at all? It was working flawlessly. I was really happy with that. It reduces my code on the node because I have some th stuff that I do on every node. Um, who, has, who has heard and makes use of the roles and profile pattern? Yeah, okay, otherwise you wouldn't have risen your hand on the first question, which definitely is too. It's encouraged to use the roles and profiles pattern. You have your system over there. The system has a certain business use case that it is there. Is this there? Uh, the, you ask the technical people, what is the system over there? And tell you, oh, it's a security nightmare. It's a public available PHP my admin without any protection and all, and it's directly connected to the CRM database. Uh, it's, it's a nightmare for us. We don't know how to secure that system yet. If it's a, such a nightmare, shut it down. No, we are not allowed to. Uh, the salespeople need it. Ah, it's a salespeople system. Okay, I go over and ask them. I say, hey, salespeople, you have the PHP my admin installation? No, we don't have a PHP my admin installation. We don't have servers. We are sales. We don't need servers. Uh, but you have that website open there. Ah, yes, yes. This is our customer relationship management database management system. Uh, okay. So you just received. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's a funny thing. Uh, so this is the business case of the system that is there and running. The business, this is the business case, the business use case, this is your role. And your role makes use of not component modules, no, of profiles. Within profiles, you make use of component modules. Those component modules are generic modules, either from Puppet Labs, from Example 42, from camp to camp. There are many, many people doing modules. And the modules are very generic. They want to cover almost all possibilities on how to set up a certain piece of software on systems. And within the profiles, you adopt the usage of these component modules to your infrastructure. You provide information like this is the DNS server system should use. This is the NTP server that system should use. No, I don't like to allow SSH root login without password to my systems. So you make use of component modules. You put that into profiles. And, profile, and with the profiles, you make use of in roles. So that is the reason no need for node inheritance anymore. A very short sentence which a, with a huge impact. Empty string comparison. When Puppet compares a variable that contains an empty string, the comparison will now evaluate to true and no longer to false. Hmm. Okay, the first question is, why was Puppet evaluating to false in the beginning? It's not logical. So an empty string is something. It's not that it's undef or false. It's an empty string. Hey, that's cool. What, do, don't, don't you like empty strings at Puppet Labs? I don't know. So, so they, they changed that to follow the logic from Ruby, uh, which is the similar now in Puppet 4. An empty string evaluates to true. So please check your code, whether you check for just an if variable name, and always, and as long as you always can ensure this will never be an empty string, uh, we're making assumptions, huh? Uh, assumptions are not good. No, no, no. You want to be precise. So please at least check for if it's an empty string, it should also evaluate to false. So then you're good to go with Puppet 4. 
What else do we have? Some more deprecations, variable namings. Variables may never ever start with a capital letter. And your developer tells you, are you completely nuts? This is a variable inside a, inside a manifest. It will never change. It's a constant. You receive the data from the node, which is FQDN, and you're using the FQDN variable, so it will not change. And I learned when I was studying com uh, a static data, which is a constant, I write the name of the variable in capital letters. Now you have Puppet 4. When Puppet 4 sees something with a big letter, this has a big meaning for a Puppet, because it's tried to evaluate. It's seeing, oh, it's a reference on a resource type. Uh, okay, what will happen? It tries to evaluate, so this is not working. So a variable may not start with a letter. A variable may not start with a digit. A variable may not contain a hyphen. A hyphen, would it be in case that it's a string? But now it's a minus sign. It's an arithmetical operator. So it tries to do some arithmetic operation inside your variable name. The result will be interesting, definitely. And a variable name may not contain a dot. Why? Think about the functions. We can prepend the functions to a variable name, can append them to a variable name by using the dot. So it would be not part of the variable name anymore. The next thing which is deprecated is reference naming syntax. I rarely know who's someone who's doing a class, white space, bracket, and then again start without colons with a capital letter. I've rarely seen that before, but it seems as if people were using it that way. So the capital letter on the, on the title is no longer allowed. The white space, which separates the resource reference and the brackets is no longer allowed. Puppet sees this white space as I have to evaluate something. I have to evaluate the reference on class. Again, an interesting result, not something like we want to expect. So please, if you have white spaces in there, remove them. If you use, always ensure that you have enclosed the title in colons. And then you're good to go with Puppet 4. What was it? Hyphens, is it when it's a string? Otherwise, it's arithmetic. Yeah, hyphens are no longer allowed in module name, in class name, in defined names. It's an arithmetical operator. It's not a string anymore. So if you find somewhere an evidence of a module, for example, syslog minus ng, because this is the name of the software, please don't name the module according to the software. What you can do at least is name it syslog underscore ng. This is a valid name in Puppet 4. Uh, even, by the way, this is deprecated since Puppet 3. So uh, everybody is reading log files on Puppet Master according to deprecations. Yes, I know. Okay, most people do that. I've heard of some people doing that. Hmm. Okay, yeah, start looking at that file. Please, do me the favor. Look for the deprecations in your existing Puppet 3 Master. There already is information inside what will be done in the future release. And the future is now. Puppet 4 is out. Another thing, I've only seen that once, really weird stuff, Ruby code in Puppet. So not using Puppet DSL, but using Ruby and using the Puppet functions from Ruby. Uh, this, this was introduced once, uh, so the main difference is you don't have .pp files in your manifest directory. You, there was the possibility of having .rb files in your manifest directory, and you recognize these by, there is something like host class, do, and an and, and this means now this is a class written in Ruby. And this is, there was a ticket for, please improve the one, so that stuff, and this was closed in uh, two years, two and a half years ago almost. So, and now it's completely gone. It will, Puppet 4 will no longer take care on .rb files in the manifest directory. You can put there as many as you like. Puppet will just refuse reading them. A large list, not complete. There's more. Okay, there's one nice thing. It's not really a hard thing we have to deal with, is the relative namespace resolution of classes. So think about you have the module, the class SSH, and you somehow have a subclass, uh, sorry, let's have the module MySQL with a class MySQL, and you have a subclass within your application module, which is app MySQL. 
And in your app MySQL subclass, you want to make use of the MySQL module. So you're saying include MySQL. And the Puppet parser will somehow show you interesting results because it first finds its subclass because it's a local namespace. So this was a problem in Puppet 3. That is the reason why you mostly find stuff like include colon colon MySQL to be sure, okay, go to the top level namespace. Don't use the local namespace. Use top level namespace and use that MySQL module, please. There was the time when people using their note declaration in the manifest directory, so next to site pp, and inside site pp they had something like uh, import notes slash star dot pp. Import notes slash star slash star dot pp. Uh, who's, who's still using import? Try to get rid of that. The most ridiculous thing I've seen so far was an import inside a module that imported another file, not by an autoloader, and this file was overwriting another module. What is it? Is it make, make use of the autoloader. Why, why is it that you're overwriting? Ah, this module doesn't work as expected. So we're overwriting this and we learned this is possible by an import. No, this is the wrong way. Please fix the module that is not working as expected or rewrite it or write a new one. But don't do import anymore. At least with Puppet 4, you don't have to care anymore. Import is no longer working. Marvelous. Due to the type system, we no longer have possibilities of matching different data types that don't match together. Yes, you can add an integer and a float, and Puppet will internally have the result being a float. That's not that of a problem. But dealing somehow with an integer and a bool value will now result in an error. So which brings us to the five powers of Puppet 4. Why is it that I like Puppet 4? The first one is I have performance and metrics. I get a deep inspect insight to the Puppet Master. The next one is I like these permanent improvements that are around. Faster software, faster, faster gathering of data, um, modern style. I like the workflow that Puppet delivers with R10K, rolling out it even to multiple systems in parallel. Enhancing coding capabilities, awesome. Make use of the type system in Puppet. Make use of the new functionality. Have everything into one file. Why split it up into two when you can have it in one? Reducing the effort. And of course, I like removed deprecations. I didn't like seeing deprecations laying around for far too long. So, okay, how should we approach to upgrading to Puppet 4? Read the documentation, read the documentation, and read the documentation, please. Look in your log files. See whether there's already deprecations. Don't upgrade, migrate, or even set up from scratch. Uh, who has a Puppet infrastructure that exists for longer than four years? Okay, uh, how long is your CA val validity? It's five years, that's the default. Maybe you have changed it, you have increased it. Okay, yeah, then you knew at advance you will never upgrade your system. I know there's a company and I know a company, I've, I've did a training course for one of, their, of the people and he told me they have a CA validity for 30 years. Um, the systems are spread amongst Europe and they can't go to every of the systems and roll out a new CA, so it would be impossible for them. So, recommended way is spin up a new master. In case that you're not that old, copy over the SSL stuff to the new master also, and when you are ready to test the system, just point it over to the other master. Yeah. Run tests. Unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, more tests. Just run tests, please. Test your code. Don't test it in production. Test it somewhere else. There's RSpec, there's Lint. Uh, the Lint parser has plugins. RSpec uh, Puppet has plugins which are completely testing whether this is working on Puppet 4. Make use of these plugins. Here during Puppet Conf, on the very first day prior today, yesterday, there was the Puppet Contributor Summit. And there were people sitting together thinking, okay, how should we announce this that there are so many plugins around? Yeah, now there's a website available was done by yesterday. So some guy took a, as a repo, I added just the plugins list here, and uh, yeah, it's a Git repo. Uh, you're missing a plugin? Uh, do a pull request. We'll add it. So it's not that of a problem. So you get all the documentation to run all the tests that you need to run. Support your modules. If you find a module not working as expected and it's not developed by yourself, the least thing you can do is 
send, send, file a bug report. The next thing you can do is write a pull request. Yeah. So most modules, the Jaron and the module forged by now, that are on GitHub, are ready for Puppet 4. Uh, was quite effort, quite a type of effort, but example 42 modules are ready for Puppet 4. Uh, on GitHub, we need to upload them. So now people ask me, okay, but did everything you just made out of your mind by yourself? No, no. There's Henrik's block, Puppet on the Edge, which provides many good information about what is new, what is upcoming. And there's a Git repository with Puppet specification from Puppet Labs. So Puppet Labs does not start right away like thinking, oh, it would be nice if we would have something like this in one week. No, they have the specification document where they prepare everything in advance. It's open to the public. You can, you can use reference these specifications and ask, uh, is this real high priority? Shouldn't you do that earlier? Like Luke mentioned in the keynote. Give, us, give, give Puppet Labs some kind of feedback on what is their upcoming work. And then, of course, you have the reference, and camp to camp put together a nice website where they showed this is how you should go with Puppet 4. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too annoying for you. I hope I didn't put too much work and effort on you by showing you what is working and what is not working. 